So I'd like to start by taking you to a very special place. It's on the water, and it's 8,000 kilometers long. It's right next to where 70% of Australians live, work, and play. And it's also a major biodiversity hotspot. And there's thousands of species in this place, and a lot of them are found nowhere else on Earth. This place, which also contributes $10 billion to the Australian economy, is called the Great Southern Reef. Can I get a show of hands of how many people have heard of it? Not many, not many. So let me tell you a little bit more about this place, because even though most of us live right next to it, we know very little about it. And knowing little about it means we also are not very good at protecting it. So the Great Southern Reef is stretches from northern New South Wales all the way down southern Australia to halfway up western Australia. And just like the Great Barrier Reef is defined by a network of interconnected coral reefs, what connects the much longer Great Southern Reef are underwater seaweed forests. Now, these are extremely productive ecosystems. They support hundreds of species, and many of them are truly remarkable. I'd say they're like near mystical in their properties. They include things like underwater dragons and blue devilfish and giant cuttlefish. And you can find all these species literally four kilometers from where we're standing right now. Unfortunately, however, the Great Southern Reef is in deep trouble. And this is because, like its more famous cousin, it's not putting up with the amount of ocean heat that we're giving it. So seaweeds like kelp need cool water to thrive. And the, when the water uh, temperatures increase, they can't cope with the stress and they die. And this is what's already happening in Western Australia, where we have already lost 150 kilometers of golden kelp forests. And a similar thing is happening to the golden kelp forests of Eastern Australia, near Coffs Harbour, which are also declining at an alarming rate. The situation is even worse in Tasmania, where we have already lost 99% of the giant kelp forests. Now, these are truly majestic ecosystems. These are seaweeds that can be tens of meters long. They can grow a few centimeters per day. And in doing so, they're drawing carbon out of the atmosphere, turning it into biomass, and providing a habitat for hundreds of species. Sadly, however, as the waters of the Tasman Sea continue to warm, these species are now on the brink of extinction, and as we lose them, we're also losing very important fisheries. Now, what my research has shown is that the seaweeds are not just influenced by the warming directly. There's a second way that warming is harmful, and it's got to do with the redistribution of species that is happening in our planet because of climate change. So, as temperatures increase, many species are responding by moving to cooler places where they can stay within their temperature ranges, their preferred temperature ranges. And for many species, this means moving towards high altitudes, towards the poles, either the North Pole or the South Pole. Now, this movement of species is particularly fast in the ocean, partly because ocean currents help with the dispersal of species, but also because under the sea there are no fences or other barriers that stop species from moving. Now, among the species that we're seeing shift their distribution on the water are beautiful coral reef fish, like this surgeon fish and parrot fish. Now, these are species that belong in places like the Great Barrier Reef, but we're increasingly finding them in higher latitude reefs, in the Great Southern Reef. Now, what these species all have in common is the fact that they're all herbivores or vegetarians. So this means they eat marine plants and they have voracious appetites. So voracious, in fact, that it can be really hard to find any seaweeds in their native coral reefs because they get eaten before they grow up. And this is a good thing in coral reefs. In fact, that's what allows corals to flourish. However, when these species shift their distribution and they enter the Great Southern Reef and they encounter entire ecosystems dominated by seaweeds, well, they feast and they can completely overgraze the kelp forest, leaving behind reefs like this. So the million-dollar question is, is there anything we can do to prevent species extinctions and protect the Great Southern Reef? And the answer is, yes, there is. And I'm going to give you a real example about fixing a different problem, but one that I think can be useful to help us face this climate change issue. 
So this is a story of another beautiful seaweed. It's called crayweed, and it forms vast, extensive underwater forests like these ones. Crayweed gets its name from crayfish or rock lobster, which associates with it as a habitat. And rock lobster is one of our most valuable fisheries in the whole of Australia. So crayweed used to be very abundant in Sydney up until the 70s or 80s, when it went missing because of appalling water quality. Now, people that were around in the 80s will remember surfing in places like Bondi Beach, right next to what they called the Bondi Cigars, which was a euphemistic term for essentially untreated raw sewage that was discharged directly onto the coastline. Now, thankfully, water quality has improved dramatically since those days, and this is partly because of the um, installment of better sewage treatment plants, but also because we now have deep ocean outfalls that release diluted sewage two to four kilometers offshore in deep water. However, despite the improvements in water quality, Crayweed just never came back to Sydney on its own. And so a few years ago, a group of us created a project to try and bring Crayweed back. We call ourselves Operation Crayweed. And what we tried to do is to bring crayweed back to the entire 70 kilometers of coastline between Palm Beach and Cronulla from where it went missing. And what we do is we take healthy crayweed from nearby forests and we subject the seaweeds to just the right amount of stress. So when we transplant them to their new Sydney home, the first thing they do to release all that stress is have sex. And with sex, of course, come babies. So I can't tell you just how excited our entire team was when we saw our first crayweed babies in Sydney, or crabies as we call them. <laughs> now, these crabies have grown up, and they've had crabies of their own, which have also grown up, and we have succeeded in creating a self-sustaining, self-replenishing crayweed forest that continues to grow. This, however, was one site, and we wanted to bring crayweed back to the whole of Sydney. So to do this, to raise the funds to make this happen, we created a crowdfunding campaign. It was Christmas around that time, so we decided to ask people to donate to our project by giving an underwater tree for Christmas. And people responded in the most amazing way. We raised enough funds to um, get started, and to this day, we continue to receive substantial philanthropic donations that are allowing us to keep growing and keep adding new crayweed sites, along with some no government grants as well. Now, I think the story of crayweed is one that shows that we can use science to reverse local extinction, to bring a species back once we have fixed the original problem, which in this case was sewage. And what we found was that when we give nature a helping hand, its ability to help itself is truly remarkable. Let's now go back to the Great Southern Reef, though. So the story I've just told you is about 70 kilometers of Sydney Metro. Obviously, the Great Southern Reef is 8,000 kilometers long, and its main threat, climate change, is one that is a much greater problem than sewage, and it's happening at a planetary scale. However, some of the solutions to climate change are also actually quite clear. You know, first of all, and forgive me for stating the obvious, we need to reduce our carbon emissions urgently. This means keeping fossil fuels in the ground and developing alternative energy sources. However, even if we do that, we are already locked into a certain amount of warming. So the losses of kelp forests that we have already seen and quantified have been caused by the equivalent of one degree of global warming. Under the Paris Agreement, we're trying to keep total global warming to two degrees. So this means that, at the very least, we have one full degree of warming ahead of us. And what this means is that we are going to continuously see the emergence of completely novel ecosystems with new assemblages of species as many taxa continue to respond to the warming by moving towards cooler places. Other species can't cope with the added heat and they die, and other species adapt and stay. And what this means is that we need a radically new approach to conservation. In fact, even the term conservation is not really appropriate anymore because we can no longer aim to conserve or retain historical ecosystems. The environment is changing too fast and our species are moving too fast. This, however, doesn't mean that we just throw our hands up in the air and we do nothing. There are things we can do. For example, there are 
techniques being developed that we could use to try and breed warm and herbivore-tolerant kelp forests, just like other people are looking into breeding heat-resistant corals. We could also develop new fisheries that specifically target range-expanding herbivorous fishes. However, in any case, we are going to be forced to make some very difficult decisions in the next few years and decades about what species we try to save and which species we let go. Should we put all our energies into trying to save the Great Southern Reef and its kelp forests? Or should we facilitate the range expansion of corals, given that the tropics are becoming such inhospitable places? In a future imperfect world, I'm afraid we're going to be forced to make some difficult choices like this one. And it's very likely that things will get worse before they'll get better. It's likely we'll make mistakes. And I think all we can do is prepare for this by developing and using the best available science to guide our interventions. If my experience is anything to go by, nature will find its way through with a careful helping hand from us. It won't be easy, but I think it will be well worth it. Thank you.